Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hugh Crumley. I'm Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs in the Graduate School. I'd like to welcome you to our final fall 2021 event in the, uh, the Graduate School's Race and Bias Conversation Series. On behalf of Dean Paul McLean and the other, other members of the Race and Bias Conversations Committee, uh, we are very happy to present to you uh, the work of graduate students at Duke. We began this series uh, about a year and a half ago to help graduate, the graduate student school community better understand systemic racism and bias and keep these issues in mind as we work to make Duke a more inclusive and supportive environment. Today, we're very happy to have three Duke PhD students with us today. Danae Diaz is a second year student in ecology. Melody Naharo is a second year student in biology. And Anita Simha is a third year student uh, candidate in ecology. They lead a course offered in the biology department called Biology uh, 750, Introduction to IDEA. IDEA stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism anti in Biology. This afternoon uh, in this event, specifically they'll be sharing with us how the class came to be and something about what the student experience in the class was like, how other departments or schools can develop programming like this, and then some specific anti-racist practices that we can engage in. That's the final part of their work which will be a kind of workshop format. A few notes concerning housekeeping for this event. Uh, during the webinar, please use the question and answer feature to submit questions. You can see that uh, in the, your Zoom uh, controls. Finally, concerning RCR credit, you'll receive RCR credit for GS 715 on your transcript if you attend and participate in the entire event. But do give us a few weeks to add this to your transcript. Uh, Thanks very much. And I'd like to uh, hand the floor over to our, our guests, Anita. Thank you, Hugh. Um, doing the old screen sharing transfer. All right. Thanks everybody for being here today. And thanks Hugh for that introduction. So as he said, we're gonna be chatting over the next 90 minutes about developing an anti-racist graduate curriculum for scientists. And Denai, Melody, and I will be facilitating us through a few different segments of this session. Um, and we're doing so on behalf of Duke Biology's IDEA Committee, which is a graduate student-led um, committee. So what brings us here today, as Hugh mentioned, is a class developed by IDEA Committee members called Biology 750S. It's a course we first proposed in December, 2019, and Ray Allen, now Dr. Raymond Allen, Dr. Lauren Carley and I wrote the syllabus in 2020, and it was taught for the first time in spring, 2021. So using this class as a case study, we're going to think about anti-racist curriculum more broadly. Our outline for today is in three parts. So first, uh, in order to give you the context of what this class even is, I'm unfortunately going to be talking a lot, uh, just telling you the story of, of what this class is and how it came to be. Uh, second, we'll have a panel where students reflect on their experiences with this class and you'll be able to ask questions um, based on what I would have told you prior. And third, we'll move into more of a workshop mode where we'll think about how you might apply one of the concepts that we discuss in a class like this to your field, whatever that might be. So to begin, story time. The IDEA Committee is a group by and for graduate students in biology and evolutionary anthropology, and we're focused on fostering inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism in our departments. At the end of my segment, I'll be putting a lot of links in the chat, so look out for them, but I would definitely um, recommend that you check out our website just to get a sense of all of the many activities that we're up to. What we do, the short answer is a lot. The slightly longer answer is that we run a variety of discussions, including one-off discussions about focused topics like the GRE and inequity and admissions practices. Our department actually recently got rid of its GRE requirement, which is a huge victory. We also do book clubs like what you're seeing in this flyer. So we've read books like Superior, Braiding Sweetgrass, The Social Life of DNA, just to name a few. 
we host workshops and seminars by people doing cool work in the area. So in the spring, folks from Project Biodiversify came and taught us how to include a broader, more representative set of scientists when we're teaching biological concepts, as well as how to more accurately and respectfully teach about sex and gender. We survey graduate students to get a sense of who's in our department, particularly when it's information that might not be captured elsewhere. Um, and we won a, a Dean's Award for Inclusive Excellence in Graduate Education in 2019 for our efforts. We share what we're up to across departments, such as via the Graduate School's Professional Development blog. And last summer, 2020, at a time when many university leaders were connecting racism in society broadly to racism within the halls of the academy, we circulated a petition with demands for racial justice to our department leadership. So, We've been successfully leading a variety of, in, of initiatives in our department for around five years now. Um, why a class? There are a variety of offerings available to biologists and looking at this sort of conceptual figure, not sure if you can see my pointer, but some are really central like those rare mandatory events, but those tend to be one-off. Multi-session offerings that allow prolonged exposure to idea concepts tend to be more peripheral or even in other departments entirely. So we wanted to fill a gap in graduate education by providing an avenue for students to engage with equity and justice concepts systematically. Many of us biologists have stumbled upon information about anti-racist pedagogy or research practices, but it's all sort of piecemeal and it's hard to know what all might be out there when you're just sort of Googling on your own. So we wanted to offer something structured at the very top right corner of this graph. Along the y-axis, the prolonged exposure matters because while those one-off events can provide tools for anti-racist practice, we need space for longer term reflection to understand the importance of those tools and the history that makes them necessary in the first place. And it takes time generally for ideas to marinate and get incorporated. In terms of the centrality, we were actually asked when we proposed the class how this was different than something that might be offered in AAAS, that's African African American Studies or Sociology. The idea was that you wouldn't necessarily want a sociologist to teach you complex genetics, so what business do biologists have teaching about anti-racism? I'd say that's actually a really common and perhaps pernicious idea that a lot of scientists hold that our field's history of racism and its current day consequences are incidental to the science. And we aren't qualified to teach about them because our, exper our expertise as scientists isn't the social part. And part of what we have been trying to say with this class is that this information belongs in a biology department, that a field's racist history is tied up with the science. And so it's our job as good scientists, not humanity scholars to know about anti-racism. Finally, we wanted to formalize and recognize the work that graduate students have been doing this whole time. Um, while the course is a first of its kind offering, the work that went into it isn't actually new. The IDEA committee had informally at this point been educating members of the department in this arena for years. So recognizing the time commitment for attendees in the form of course credit uh, we felt that was important because it's hard for students to choose to think about this stuff if it's seen as taking time away from their education rather than being part of their education. And recognizing the valuable labor of instructors in the form of material support, a TA ship, uh, is also important. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on this slide and it's because the justification for this class, why it was needed and why it's needed specifically as an offering in biology is a big part of the story of the class. Um, it is a first of its kind class at Duke and the only one like it as far as I'm aware. So as y'all are thinking about your own fields, I hope you also consider that these same sort of conditions and opportunities might be at play for you. Okay, with this foundation, onto the process. Like many big projects, uh, this course was developed really slowly and then sort of all at once. A lot of it also happened over Zoom, as you can see, um, which was certainly interesting. 
We first made a proposal in late fall 2019 to our department leadership um, for this course, which, you know, we'd at first envisioned would be a two semester track with multiple TA lines and tons of bells and whistles. Um, we sought advice from department leaders on, on logistics and from area experts like those in science and society, BioCore, and other sort of related programs and departments on content. Um, and folks were really supportive across the board. It's, it was kind of incredible to see. It was clear that there was a lot of excitement. We sent out an initial interest survey um, based on feedback that we received to show that there was demand for such a course and we received 94 responses. So the appetite was there. A big question mark though, was how such a course actually gets approved. Um, since a course of this nature had never been taught in biology, we weren't really sure who might need to give the thumbs up and we all had sort of different instincts. Um, and our second big question mark was TA support because we learned that for Trinity Arts and Sciences to contribute to departmental TA lines, a course ought to be geared towards undergraduates. But we decided we really wanted this course to be by and for graduate students. We met really collaboratively with our department's leadership iteratively, and we realized that for a 700 plus graduate level course, simple DGS approval is all that's needed through the Trinity Arts and Sciences process. Um, and the department incredibly was able to support a fellowship for a graduate student to lead this course. Um, and over the course of the fall, our amazing DGSs, Amy Schmidt and Bill Morris met with us through the process of syllabus development. We spent the fall sort of sorting out logistics like class size, finalizing our course plan and inviting guest speakers along the lines of uh, materially supporting important contributions, we made sure we could offer honoraria to those guest speakers. Um, we also wanted this to not be an only of its kind sort of thing. So we made a public version of the syllabus in case others were seeking inspiration. And I'll share that in the chat with you all at the end of this short talk. Um, We've already been consulted by biology departments at other universities, which is super exciting. So it's clear that Duke students aren't unique either in, in wanting this kind of class. In spring 2021, this course was offered for the first time. And yeah, I just want to acknowledge that our department took a huge step in formally recognizing the value of student engagement with inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism concepts. Um, by valuing that engagement in the form of course credit and in materially supporting the course instructor. It's a really huge and important deal and I'm still so thrilled about it if you can't tell. Okay, so this is sort of just like the logistics piece to give y'all a sense of what it took to make this class happen. Deciding what to cover was another big piece of making this course happen. The big question we'd been hearing from grad students in the department and casual hallway conversations was, what steps can I take when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? We wanted to address that question meaningfully, and we realized that in order to get at that question, we had to start much further back. As I'm sure you all know, systemic issues don't have quick band-aid solutions. There's no real life hack to solve racism. That said, we can equip ourselves to know better and do better. So through the process of course development, we realized that we wanted to teach a course that started by asking about the history of power and oppression in biology and the stakes of recognizing that history. By connecting the past to the present day, we'd have the necessary context to discuss the questions of action steps without that being a superficial endeavor. So based on this set of questions, we came up with a three-part structure to the course. I've highlighted sort of the key question that we investigate in each section, and these smaller bullet points are showing you examples of class topics. So we start with theory and history, in which we discuss injustice and inequity in the founding of biology as a field. The main theme of this section is what it means for science to be a socially embedded field of study. One of our class topics is about scientific isms. So racism, sexism, colonialism, um, some things that aren't technically isms like eugenics. 
In that class period, we discuss eugenics and the origins of the field of genetics. We go beyond the, con the conversation of, was this eugenicist really a bad guy, to consider what it means structurally that elite universities had departments of eugenics as late as the 1920s or even 1930s. From that foundation of where our field comes from, we get into contemporary issues. So we think about how power dynamics are enacted on university campuses and in the broader community in the current day. As an example, we spend a class session on colonialism and modern science. We discuss the idea of parachute science, which is when researchers sort of float in, um, enter another community to gather data, perhaps even posing as saviors, but without engaging with or acknowledging the local community. We do some key readings and have class discussion about what it takes to avoid doing that and why it's important not to. From this further foundation, we get into best practices in terms of research, teaching, and mentorship. As an example, we talk about research on the factors that cause undergraduates to either stay in or leave uh, research opportunities. This is an example of a guest speaker we had, uh, the newly minted Dr. Logan Jin, um, who studies undergraduate research experiences. So we use um, his research as a launching pad for a discussion of how we can practice inclusive mentorship for our undergraduate researchers and work study students. Finally, to foster deeper engagement with a particular topic beyond the week's short reading, each student reads a book that does one of a few things. It might place a biological subfield in a social context like Superior, which explores the responsibility that geneticists have to the current day resurgence of race science. Um, students might read a book that considers power and how it plays out in the academy, such as The Privileged Poor, which explores how elite colleges select a few disadvantaged students at the expense of most disadvantaged students, or three, one that explores an alternative to racist or colonialist science, such as Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, which situates scientific inquiry within a broader Indigenous epistemology. Um, I want to note now that as we get further into sort of the material of this course in the panel and in the workshop, we'll be talking about biologists or scientists more broadly that had some pretty unsavory beliefs, particularly towards Black and Indigenous people, folks from the Global South, and queer and trans people. Um, and we definitely don't endorse those beliefs, but part of the goal of this course is to interrogate how views like um, eugenicist views uh, became widespread among biologists. So just want y'all to know that it's likely to come up. But all of this being said, um, what the idea committee is, how we decided to make this class, what it took for the class to happen, and then what the structure of the class looks like. I'd um, now like to move us into section two, student stories. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen actually and pass it to Melody. Hi everyone, and if I can please have our other panelists, please turn on their cameras and audio. Thank you, okay. Yes, again, um, my name is Melody Naharo. I'm a second year PhD student in the biology department. Uh, I'm co-advised by doctors John Willis and John Shaw. And today I'm mainly going to actually be monitoring this group of panelists, Ali Schrock, Richard Wong, and Annie Harshbarger, um, uh, their experiences and takeaways from the class. We were all the first cohort of students to take this course. Um, and, you know, it's important that we have more than just one person uh, input on how their time went. So uh, I'm going to get uh, our panelists a set of questions, but uh, attendees feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section. Um, but anyways, let's get started. So if we can get started with maybe Ali, just because you're the first person on my Zoom screen on um, what you're like, if you can introduce yourself and 
following the question, what surprised you the most from the class and what were some unexpected lessons or moments that stand out to you? And then we'll move on through the panelists as time goes by. Okay, so introduction and answer that question as well. Yes, or actually, yes, that's okay. okay. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, I'm Allie. I am a third year PhD student in evolutionary anthropology. My pronouns are she, her and hers. Uh, and I study generally the relationship between the brain and social behavior in lemurs and other primates. Um, and I guess surprising thing to me, uh, what really sticks in my head as something that surprised me was when we talked about how the, um, we read an article, I think it was entitled Land Grab Universities. Um, it was about how public universities and land grant universities in the US um, had really stolen indigenous land and used it not only for their university campuses and everything, but also to basically sell to uh, create or fill their endowments. Um, and so that really was surprising to me. I didn't know um, that part of that history. Um, and it just really shows how universities were really built on such a colonial foundation. And so, um, yeah, I think that was probably the most surprising thing that I learned. Thanks, Ali. And if we can uh, move on to Annie. Thanks, Melody. Um, same question after my intro. Okay, cool. Um, so my name is Annie Harshbarger. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a second year in uh, marine science and conservation, and I study marine mammal behavioral ecology. Um, I think one of the most surprising moments in this class for me was sort of um, towards the end, we had a guest lecture from Dr. Tema Okun, and she did an amazing job. And she had also just come and done a series of workshops with the Duke Marine Lab that I participated in. And she came and talked about um, principles of white supremacy culture in the workplace and how white supremacy culture shows up really in any workplace, not just in that in the academy. Um, and it was just sort of this like, oh, moment as she was going through these principles, things like perfectionism and either or thinking, concentration of power, individualism, um, all of these things that I feel like I know I've experienced in many, if not all of the workplaces I've been a part of, and probably all of us have, and sort of being able to identify the root of those things. Um, yeah, was a, a big moment. Okay, thanks, Annie. And Richard, if you can go next. Hi, uh, yeah, my name's Richard. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I'm in the University Program of Ecology. I'm a second year PhD student. Um, I research carnivorous plants as a model system for community dynamic changes and uh, climate change. Um, first question was surprising lesson. I think the most surprising thing was how much we talked about history and societal context in terms of research. Um, it wasn't a specific lesson that we talked about uh, or a specific fact, but overall, just like how much it's not always the person who's doing the research, but the things that are happening in the world at the time and how those things might be different or uh, applicable to the things that are happening today uh, and how we should apply those things to our current research. Thanks. Um, and so far, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to move on to our next guiding question is, um, how have you implemented what you've learned so far in the class in your own work, whether it's your research or TA work or vice versa? And we can go back in the same order, starting with Allie. Um, I guess one thing that I've done is really making an effort to pay my undergraduates that I mentor who help me in research. Um, Anita talked a little bit about Logan Jin's uh, talk with us, but really just thinking about the inequity of opportunity that can appear in research opportunities. And so often they are unpaid um, or, you know, course credit is another thing. But, um, but yeah, so I've really made an effort to either write grants myself or help my undergraduates write grants or whatever the case might be um, in order to help them get paid for their work, because I think that's something really tangible that we can do not only as graduate students, but uh, higher up as well, you know, with the faculty and those that are getting, you know, the bigger grants um, 
to, yeah, just kind of even out some of that inequity of opportunity and allow students who might need to get paid for their time uh, to also have research opportunities. No, uh, that's awesome. Uh, Annie, can you share your thoughts? Yeah, so um, the timing of this course was really interesting for me because I was teaching for the first time during the same semester that we took it. Um, and I, I was a TA, but I was delivering four of the lectures for the course, and I had never done that before. And so I sort of had this moment where I was trying to figure out how to do it and what um, story I wanted to tell in my lectures. And it was kind of scary to have that much control over it. And I think, you know, I was trying to sort of weave in things that I was learning at the same time um, that I was teaching my students. And definitely um, some, I think it definitely helped. And I had, you know, some students reach out and say, thank you so much for talking about this. One of them was like talking about how colonialism had contributed to the demise of a lot of seabird populations. But then I also had places where I caught myself slipping up because I learned just like a little too late. Like I remember when we talked about, um, or we read an article by Garrett Hardin that had like the, it was called Living on a Lifeboat. It had a lot of really problematic sentiments in it. Um, and I think literally less than a week before I had been giving a lecture on trophic ecology and mentioned competitive exclusion and just mentioned his name. And really all I said was like, oh, this idea was popularized in ecology by Garrett Hardin and I moved on, but I didn't have that context and I wasn't able to provide it for my students. So it's really shaped the way that I think about teaching and the way that I think about preparing to teach. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, and I just wanted to add a quick note, um, since you you and Ellie both have talked about TAing so far, where uh, I agree that I, I wasn't TAing yet when I took this course, but the way I teach my students about evolutionary genetics, which is what I emphasize on, has very much changed because a lot of the way, a lot of the ways we can teach genetics uh, can be misused to support racism. And that's something I hadn't learned until I took this course. But with that, uh, Richard, what what were what were your takeaways from the course? Um, my biggest takeaway was more about how you can contribute to conversations. Uh, a lot of the way that the discussions in the class were set up were um, no interrupting anybody and kind of moving along and saying if you're a, a strong participator kind of stepping back and if you're not doing vice versa um, and in that way we can kind of include all of the different voices within a community uh, and making sure everybody feels safe and able to talk and, and those kinds of things are are important for all the all the conversations that i have in life but most specifically uh the te teaching situations Cool. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. That was something else I feel like has been uncommon in our academic spaces, where it's a lot about who can be the most um, present person in a room, but uh, moving toward away from that uh, thought process and focusing on it, making sure that it we have an equitable distribution of who's thoughts and opinions are voiced. Um, and we do have some questions now from attendees and Anita, Denai, uh, feel free to also chime in. The first is from Madeline Wilkin Wilkerson. Her question is, or their question is, could there be a way to teach this course to graduate students in other science disciplines? And so anyone from, can just chime in when you want to. For me, as a student in the course, one thing that I learned is that, like, if we were all much more like interdisciplinary, uh, we could all benefit a lot. Uh, and so, I think a course like this would be relevant, you know, across disciplines. Um, I, I didn't help design the course, but as someone who took it, um, I could see how it could specifically apply to other departments. But I also am not in the biology department; I'm in evolutionary anthropology. But um, a lot of what I learned has helped me kind of apply more of the like critical lens that I learned about in the biology course to my own field. Um, so yeah, that's just my thoughts as a student in the course. Um, are we just kind of going or is there an anywhere? Oh, cool. Um, also as just a student didn't help uh, create the course whatsoever, but I think a lot of what I learned was more just a frame of mind and how you're thinking about certain topics more than uh, any specific subject. Uh, obviously, there'd be a lot of uh, historical research going into creating the course, but I think just the idea of 
what you want to get out of the course um, is the main part, not necessarily the, the specific topics. Yeah, I think I think every every discipline should have a course like this. I hope that that's something that comes out of this course and the amazing job that Ray and Anita did with it is that, you know, other departments will be able to provide support um, and formal recognition of the work that goes into it. And honestly, we could do like five more courses um, of this in biology and and still have a long way to go. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to add to this, uh, as again, as someone who didn't uh, create the course, I very much believe that you can create a course like this for any subject. I mean, this course specifically did emphasize a lot of biological history because it was geared towards biology students, but you can, I'm pretty sure that in most, if not every scientific, uh, scientific field from physical sciences, chemical sciences, there is, a lot of uh, material you can go through, especially because we didn't just talk about the history. We did, uh, as Anita was saying in their uh, presentation, at first we did go on the, about the history and the theory, but we did talk a lot about colonialism and modern science uh, and what that means. You know, we don't have time to go over what that means in the seminar, but because there's so many topics we, that we went over in that class. But we also talked about workplace uh, like environments, whether how we can be more, uh, or mentors following the foundations of IDEA, inclusivity, diversity, equity, and anti-racism, but also, uh, you know, opening our eyes to, uh, you know, higher ups in academia who might not be following these, these foundations and learning how important it is to speak up and change things and not just accept them, our environments the way they are. But anyways, long answer. Um, and uh, unless uh, Anita, who did uh, create the course, has any uh, comments, I can move on to the next questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in just because I see that there's another question from Aiden asking about the course content development process, particularly on the practical side. They ask whether there were any particular areas that we chose to focus on and why. And to that, I would say that um, our main goal with the last sort of professional development section was to expand folks's toolboxes in terms of research, teaching, and mentorship. So we tried to include content in all of those three areas. and. Um, as Annie mentioned with the white supremacy culture reading, we really wanted to include something about white supremacy culture in particular, given that Duke is um, a PWI, a predominantly white institution, and um, we could call it a historically white college university. Um, but besides that, I think as the panelists have sort of been saying, um, the, the goal is sort of to apply anti-racist principles and take a critical lens to specific case studies as a way of practicing doing that generally. And um, hopefully from this class, folks have sort of gotten practice doing so in their particular areas of research expertise. So um, I do think that as this course um, continues to be taught annually, um, the, the specific topics would likely change instructor to instructor. Um, the, the first instructor, Ray Allen, who also helped develop the course, has a particular expertise in indigenous studies. And so a lot of what we talked about um, under his sort of facilitation was in that area, um, for example. Hope that helps. Thanks, Anita. And uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, let me shift through. Uh, here, let me put answer live so everyone can see it. They ask, or they say, I wondering how the energy generated from this course can be channeled through students to department and graduate school administrators to help solidify necessary system systemic changes within graduate education at Duke. So like before, now you all can just chime in uh, when you want. I think, sorry, uh, it, it'll be quick. I think one of the big things is getting numbers behind any kind of 
change that you want to see. So a lot of these things are going uh, not unnoticed, but uh, unspoken, because a lot of people might feel like they might not uh, have a strong enough singular voice. And I think these kinds of conversations help bring people together, uh, which is much more effective at creating an, any kind of systemic change. Um, yeah. I would say also to kind of like, obviously in this case, we're talking about creating graduate courses. And uh, in this case, it's, it was run by graduate students and everything, which I think is really valuable. But I also think there's value in kind of extending more of a dialogue between either the creators or the students in the course and the faculty and higher ups, because as we know, you know, graduate students have limited power to make systemic change. Um, and so, for example, in evolutionary anthropology, we've actually taken some times during our department seminar uh, slot every week to have conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion issues. Um, and I think like some of the things that I've learned in the idea class, I actually shared with faculty or other people in our department. Um, and they were kind of like, oh, you know, I never knew that, or like, that's a good point or something like that. Um, and so I think not just having the faculty to leave it as just like, oh, like that's what the graduate students are doing. And like, that's great for them, but like, it doesn't involve me. I think like having it be more of a dialogue somehow between the students in the course and faculty, whether faculty are teaching the course or just whether they're kind of like, you know, tacitly supporting it, um, whatever. Um, so yeah, kind of just, yeah, getting it out of just the graduate students. Yeah, I agree with Ali. I don't necessarily have the best way to do that, um, but I think like she was saying about how graduate students often have somewhat limited power to make change, we also have the most energy for it. Um, and so I think somehow sort of making, bridging that gap, like making this step up to the faculty and staff of the department will be key. Yeah, I actually have a thought as well for this question, um, which builds off actually of all of our guest panelists uh, comments, which is, um, I mean, first of all, as as a, someone who took this course, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I, even though I, you know, I, I am a first generation Latina, I was always kind of afraid of taking time to take these types, do this kind of work, take these courses, because I was afraid that this work wasn't going to be valued by um, my higher ups, you know, my committee members, my advisors, so on and so forth. Um, and I was afraid that participating in this work would could eventually lead into me taking time away from my work, my science, um, and you know, potentially risk my ability to stay in the program. But even just taking the course alone, you there, you just learn so much that isn't talked about in your field that it's really hard to ignore. It's really hard to just move on with your life and as if you didn't know all information. Um, I ended up, you know, I it was after the course that I realized, okay, I want to, I don't want to be all bark. I I want to actually put my money where my mouth is. I want to take action. I not just you know, say, like, say the right things, go to the right seminars. I want to actually be a, a part of that change. And in terms of, you know, something faculty members could do, because this is a course for grad students is, you know, put value in your students work towards idea, because if it's just seen as a hobby, if it's just seen as a side project, there's never going to be actual change systemic change in your departments and your fields. Um, but with that, we do have more questions, so I can move on. Uh, oh, well, which I, uh, Aiden, I hope this also answered your question about, here, I'll also put it live so other people can see. Um, Aiden says, also for students, what motivated you to take this course? For organizers, could you talk more about what you did in terms of course credit, outreach, other logistics? to get folks to enroll, make it possible considering other demands on students' time. So I've already unintentionally answered this, but are there any other thoughts uh, from any of you? I guess as far as like why I wanted to take the course, um, I would just say that I kind of heard like small tidbits about, you know, like the racist or problematic history of biology or related fields. Um, but I knew that there was a lot more that I didn't know. Um, and so I kind of just felt like it was a great opportunity to learn more about that and also to learn how, you know, we can try to combat that, be aware of it, whatever. Um, 
so yeah, I think I just, I wanted to take the opportunity to learn more about um, idea issues um, in biology. Um, sort of similar. I um, So I started my PhD in the fall of 2020, which was an interesting time to start a PhD. I was like the height of the early pandemic. And like Anita mentioned at the beginning of their talk, um, people were connecting racism in society to racism, racism in the academy and talking about it really openly and often in a way that I had never seen before. Um, and so it really made me think about what I wanted my development during my PhD to look like. And I really wanted this to be a structured part of it. Um, thinking about not just sort of what I thought about as an undergrad with my training as a scientist was how do I wanna to contribute to what we know about science? And then the way that I am thinking about it now is also how do I wanna to contribute to the way science works? And part of that is just learning how and why science is the way it is too. Yeah, kind of similar to you guys. Um just seeking to educate myself, uh, especially since my main goal uh, for my PhD is to become an educator. Uh, I'd be perpetuating a lot of themes that would be, uh, that I was taught were, um, I was always taught that these themes were taboo, aren't really meant to be in the like realm of scientific conversation or academic conversation. Uh, and in reality, they are very intertwined, kind of like what Anita was saying in the overview that these conversations are very much a footstone for all kinds of subjects. Thanks everyone. And we have a question by Matthew Slayton who says, is the goal for graduate students to teach undergraduate students as well, or is the focus on teaching other graduate students? I don't know if there's a specific answer to that, and I don't know if that's the best answer, but um, I think it was so inclusive that I didn't really think about it in terms of like dynamics of like there's the faculty and then the graduate students and then the other undergraduate students um, and more of it as a this is a community of people and this is how they should talk and this is how they should move conversations forward. Um, I don't know if that answers the question or not, but that was kind of the vibe that I was getting. I mean, I think in other departments, it's, you know, what what your department is looking to do or get out of it. I mean, I think it is really valuable to have like at a graduate level. Um, but I mean, certainly undergraduates could benefit from the same type of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's just what the department is interested in pursuing at the time. Yeah, I can add to that as well. And again, Anita, feel free to chime in if you would like. Um, I, the way I saw this course was one, um, you know, as graduate students, we're supposed to be the future leaders of our fields. And so what we learn, we will implement in the rest of our work, whether that be our mentorship, our, you know, our research, how we, pro you know, if something we learned was the importance of language, even, you know, even for me who I study plants, the importance of my, the language of how I talk about certain genetic uh, phenomena. And um, also, our, you know, we're even most, if not all of us, TA uh, undergrads. Uh, that being said, in terms of if this was open to undergrad, this course specifically was open to undergrads as well. I think so, for example, biology, there is so many students and like in the the undergraduate curriculum. And because this was grad student only, it was very much an interactive course. It wasn't a lecture that we sat through for an hour and a half. We talked a lot. We had really hard, deep conversations that would have been very difficult in a large group. Um, so yeah, keeping it to, I think it was 15 to 25, somewhere in there students. And we would have, go into breakout rooms and have longer conversations that made the experience uh, at least for me, more meaningful. So let's see, we have another question. 
And I think, yeah, we have 10 more minutes in our panel before we take a five minute break. So bear, uh, so attendees, please bear with us. But here by Crystal Peoples, can you talk a little more about the resurgence of race science and how this course can help combat race essentialism coming from the academy and also from things like pop culture ancestry tests? This is a topic very deep to my heart, uh, but I can let, if you all have something to say, please go, go first. Okay, I can start us off. Um, yes, again, I, uh, my, my work emphasizes in evolutionary genomics, particularly for plants, um, but resurgence of race science, at least from my understanding, and this one's going to learned and still learning population genetics um the way that for example pop culture ancestry test work is they don't actually which i mean i think it's so that is people can it can be more accessible uh intellectually i guess um they don't go in and explaining how these genetic tests actually tell you your race which actually it's not your race what these tests are telling you about our what population group your ancestors came from before geographic uh, or before humans could freely move around the world, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, re something we talk about in the class is how race, I know a lot of people roll their eyes when we say this, but it is scientifically proven to be a social construct. It's not, there's no scientific basis for race. But because a lot of geneticists and genomicists stray away from explaining how our fields explains uh, or teaches genetics and or doesn't talk about the social implications of it, a lot of people can use race for, you know, exclusionary reasons versus, you know, trying to emphasize the difference between different races or trying to, you know, use the excuse that the reason why, you know, again, trigger, trigger because this is something that we don't endorse, but we talk about why, like, oh, it's, because of genetics, why there's predominantly, or why a lot of institutions are predominantly white. You know, um, these are all concepts that we were able to put together because of this course. Um, any, any, any of you have thoughts? Uh, I remember there was a specific class that talked about this exact thing, actually, um, and kind of similar to what you were saying, Melody, that there wasn't ever any kind of, I guess, unless you had taken a course similar to this, there wasn't any kind of discussion about what race and ethnicity really meant, and, and that they are kind of social constructs and not really like, they're not specific subgroups proving that one specific thing is or one specific group of people is better than another specific group of people etc um and i think a lot of things that are coming out of that the way that we were taught these things in say uh high school or or middle school was a lot of race theory is like being brought into a mainstream view without an understanding of what it any of it means We have time for, I think, only one more question. Uh, okay, let's see. Here's the next one. How, so let me make it live. How do we deal with important scientific advancements coming with many of these issues, either from specific researchers slash faculty or systems universities? Um, and so I I think in other words, what uh, this attendee is trying to ask is, well, I, I, I think it's, clear that like, what sh like should we avoid you know these new technologies should, like how do we talk about them how do we incorporate them into society um I, in other words i believe is what they're trying to say but yes please comments so this is sort of a sideways answer to this question and maybe i'm not understanding the question 100 percent, but um I think one of the things that we sort of talked about often in this course is that it's going to be hard and we don't necessarily know, like it's not straightforward. Like we talked about um, Ronald Fisher, who created a lot of the methods of statistics that are really widely used in natural sciences. And he was 
like a terrible eugenicist. So it's like, do we continue to use the methods that he developed? We're really dependent on them. How do we, um, how do we reconcile those things? And so I think it's sort of ongoing, um, at least in some, some of the situations like that. Yeah. I'd also say like another topic we talked a lot about is how science is not objective and it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So I think just keeping that in mind and like it kind of goes both ways. So like society is influenced by, you know, scientific discoveries or whatever that come out. Um, but also scientists are influenced by, you know, societal norms and structures around them. And so kind of like keeping both of those in mind um, is something that we should do as scientists, because, you know, if it's just like, oh, well, I'm really interested in this from a scientific perspective, like thinking about, you know, what are the societal things that might be influencing you? And also how might that be perceived um, in society? Because it's going to be. Um, and so, yeah, that's maybe also a non-answer, but it's something that we talked a lot about in class um, and that I think applies. This might seem kind of like an abrupt answer, but I think uh, the how to deal with important scientific advancements is um, conversation and education. Uh, I think a lot of what we had talked about in the class was how a lot of uh, personal history about these scientists were kind of swept under the rug for a lot of us in, in earlier education. And these are only kind of things coming up now, late, like into our PhDs, which is um, fairly advanced for many people. So it's it's the education and discussion, I think, would be the short answer there. Yeah, I, uh, which is, it's uh, great. This is actually a great segue into our, our next uh, session, which we'll have after a break. But before we do that, uh, the, like, my thought is, and again, these is all from what I've learned from the class and how to implement what we've learned is we, for starters, we can't ignore the fact like the connection between science and society like Ali was saying um not just because not just because we're like oh we're scientists we're not social scientists or, or we don't do social sociology or humanities um our work affects society first of all um but second of all it's kind of like and this might sound off it's this conversation you know we hear a lot with social media and uh children where you know when you're we, you know, science has shown that when parents, you know, ignore or just pretend social media doesn't exist and just ban it from their children and not teaching them the skills to actually use it in a healthy manner. And the same applies for science. Um, we have to learn the skills for implementing technology into society in a healthy way in our work and our own lives. Uh, you know, like, you know, like these ancestry tests, they're fun. Uh, so they can be informative, but we also have to be aware of the context behind them. And then they have end of the day, they're they're mainly for fun. They're not a supplement for genetic counseling. They're not a supplement for, um, you know, going to a doctor because it tells you some of the medical things are genetically predisposed of. It's uh, and if we can have these tools to communicate our science, then society, of course, will benefit as well. And, you know, what the past few year, two years has taught us is it would benefit everyone for science to be accessible to everyone. Uh, but we have time, time, we've hit time and uh, apologies to everyone who, we, if we can answer your questions, it was, I'm so happy that we got so many questions, um, but we're going to take a five minute break. And after our break, which will end at 3.30, uh, Denai will lead a workshop style session where we discuss one of the concepts we actually go over in class very briefly. Obviously, there, we can't go over a whole class in 25 minutes, but yeah, okay, uh, see you all in five minutes. Okay, um, and so for this last 30 minutes of the session, I wanted to provide you all with an actionable way to think about your own work and field regarding idea concepts. We're gonna do a workshop on identifying and addressing harmful figures in our respective fields. Um, and so there are multiple approaches for discussing and citing harmful figures. We wanted to begin with giving an example from our own field 
using one possible approach, which is choosing to cite alternative, otherwise equal, less harmful individuals. Garrett Hardin, which was actually brought up in the um, Q&A section of the workshop, is an influential ecologist and scientist who is often known most for two concepts, the tragedy of the commons and the com competitive exclusion principle. One thing that we're going to highlight today is that we cannot speak of an individual's work while ignoring their harmful ideologies because science and academia at large is not entirely objective and is often influenced by the researcher's biases. Although Hardin is a prolific and highly cited figure in ecology, in choosing to cite his work or in reading his work, we can not do so without acknowledging his wrongdoings as a white supremacist. If we did, we may be perpetuating his harmful ideology. Two ways to approach his theories are as follows. The tragedy of the commons as described by Hardin and as can be seen by the title of the bottom, at the bottom left, Lifeboat Ethics, the Case Against Helping the Poor, claims that the strong and wealthy are more worthy and somehow inherently better, and the weak or poor are not worth saving. This serves to perpetuate classist and racist ideology. This theory has since been disproven. Scientists such as Eleanor Ostrom um, and her The Miracle of the Commons, as seen on the bottom right, have since shown that individuals are indeed able to share resources with generosity and foresight nonetheless, providing new, more sound theories to co contemplate that highlight the ways individuals, more often than not, actually work together successfully. In regards to his second most known work, the competitive exclusion principle, which states that individuals cannot share the exact same niche indefinitely without it resulting in in niche differentiation, which is seen in the image on the top right, um, where let's say, for example, the for those that are not familiar, the yellow birds are the native birds. And then the red birds being birds that come in, um, initially the yellow birds are able to access um, the resources on the, on the whole tree, but as the red birds come in, the red birds essentially push the yellow birds to only be able to feed on the top or the bottom and the red birds then feed on the bark. So essentially niche partitioning. So this idea of the competitive exclusion principle, instead of citing um, Har uh, Garrett Hardin, uh, who, as we have already mentioned, has some pretty um, harmful ideology behind him and some a lot of his ideas actually, um, we can cite Georgi Gauz, who actually came up with the theory before Hardin. In other words, when teaching about the competitive exclusion principle, we could choose to cite Gauss, who provided the first experimental evidence of competitive exclusion principle instead of Hardin, who mostly formulated those ideas made by Gauss into a catchy paper that actually gets cited more often than the originator of the idea. This is especially true considering the work that is stated in the principle and is cited in Hardin's work is Gauss's original idea, not Hardin's. And so therefore, when choosing who and what theories to cite and teach, not just in behavioral ecology as in the example we get, I, I just gave, but in any field, um, we have to make sure that we make ourselves knowledgeable of the individual behind the work that we are teaching, citing, et cetera, and behind the work that we're, you know, knowledge that we're spreading um, as academics, but also search for and acknowledge individuals and work that are not founded in harmful ideologies. And so um, for the next five minutes, we will challenge you, we wanna challenge you to think of and reflect on any harmful figures in your field and write them down using sticky notes on Jamboard. And so um, uh, Anita or Melody will post um, the link um, in the chat for you guys to, to use. The icon um, is pictured here is the sticky note icon. So it's kind of that little square with the little squiggles on it. Um, and essentially uh, there is already an example up there uh, for Hardin. Um, we want you guys to um, put your examples of harmful figures in your field that are often taught about sometimes, you know, without explanation of their, um, their harmful ideology. And so, I'm now gonna um, mute myself, give you guys time to post and actually share the Jamboard page so that all of us can see the notes as they're being added. And please put any questions um, in the chat as well that we may address um, during this time.
denied. So it says that there are too many people on the file. What we can do is duplicate this Jamboard and send out that link as well so that people can try to access the second one. So we can, I don't know how you feel about that. That sounds good. We, I might not be able to share both of them, but um, I will look at both of them. And if there's any like uh, non repeats, I'll see if I can try and add them into the one that I'm sharing. Okay. Yeah, I'll post that right now. What we could do too is um, since Denai is sharing her screen, for those of you who are attending, once you've written your name down, just go ahead and X out. That way there aren't too many people in there. That works. That's a good idea too. Yeah, I'm working on the copy as we speak. Also, if you're not able to access it, but would like to add, um, you can also put it in the chat and then either me, Melody or Anita can add it on there for you um, if you're still having trouble as well. Uh, let me see, oh, clear frame, here we go. I want to give a couple more minutes for those that haven't been able to um, add their um, ideas into this page. Um, and I also see that there is a question in the Q&A section that I wanted to address um, while people were adding their ideas. Um, the question, um, I'm going to make it live so you guys can see it as well, states, citing the true or originator, the idea is certainly a valid principle. What if the true originator has some objectionable views? Would you advocate citing later adopter of the idea instead? And so Anita and Melody, please feel free to jump in. Um, but we actually discussed this um, in the, some of the other takeaways uh, because it is the case where um, the, original, or the originator of the idea may also present some objectionable views. And oftentimes if that is the case and there is no way to um, go uh, to cite a different individual that also, you know, founded the idea, one may, when presenting the information, um, be sure to be upright and forthright about the, um, the, the harmful ideology of the individual. Also, I believe providing the space to discuss um, that part of it is also important, um, as opposed to just being like, yeah, well, you know, Hardin was uh, a white supremacist moving on, but rather like providing a space to um, discuss things around that will also be important. Um, Anita, Melody, if you have anything to add, please feel free. I think that was great. Okay, I see there is a, good amount of uh, responses on the page. Um, I hope everyone that wanted to was able to um, add to this Jamboard page. Um, so uh, I know one of the ones that uh, was also added in the chat that from an individual that wasn't able to post it was Conrad Lorenz. So that's one that seems to be um, in not only in here, but ethology and other fields. Um, you know, we see uh, uh, Fisher in um, statistics, um, Thomas Hub Hubbard in classics, um, Franz Joseph Gall, neuroscience, just to be examples. And so uh, the next thing that we wanted to do to make it uh, go a little step further is, um, oh, oh, some more individuals. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, y'all. Uh, it seems 
the second page was intended to um, ask in what context were you first, did you first hear about these individuals in the classroom research paper where their oppressive practices mentioned? And so it seems uh, you all used that to kind of add on to the individual portion. So what I'm gonna do is add a third page for you all to be able to answer this question in terms of what context was this individual first brought up um, or brought to your attention. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be necessarily the, the specific individual you put in the first section, but um, in what context may we anticipate these um, individuals being brought up. And so um, either Melody, Anita, or I will add that third page for you guys to be able to answer that. And again, if you have any questions or are not able to access it, please put it in the chat and we'll add that on for you. So as some of these um, responses are coming in, I'm just going to read a couple of them out loud. Um, so one of them says, in my intro class, in, neuro, in my intro neuro class during freshman year, another one says, in the classroom, again, classroom, um, one says, again, classroom. So it seems like classroom is one of the most often places where these individuals are being um, first brought up and talked about. Oh, this one's interesting. So when someone brought up uh, Cuvier and um, how lots of animals are actually named, the common names are named after him. So not just in the classroom, but also in society at large and how um, community science and how individuals are named. Learning statistical modeling. I'm gonna think that's Fisher. <laughs> um, oh, actually, Friends Garden. Okay. So, also research papers. So it seems like there's research papers, classroom seems to be the most common, um, uh, community science. Uh, lab. Okay. And so thinking um, about first, right, we talked about what the who these individuals are. Now we're thinking about where they come up. This last portion is probably the, the biggest portion is what are some more responsible ways to teach about or cite harmful figures? And so um, when these individuals are brought up in the classroom or when we hear these individuals' names in you know, community science, um, how can we address these problems? What are um, other ways to do so responsibly? 
Um, one of the approaches is what I discussed earlier with right China site or the originator or a co-originator right with less harmful ideas but what do you all think might be additional ways to do this and uh, this is on the third page of the jam board please feel free to um, type in your ideas So just to read some of these as they're coming up, um, someone said contextualize their frame. For example, Fisher was chair of the Department of Eugenics. Um, another individual says be mindful of who the target audience may be. Um, another person says cite alternative scholars if possible. Another one says clearly discuss wrongdoings and how it impacted people. Um, another one says think about whether using the work well, someone of the of the scholar is truly the only way to com to complete your work. So, are there alternative ways to, com to complete your work um, that doesn't involve proliferating this scholar? Um, let's see. Completing, uh, including explanations of the harmful ideas, along with the concepts that contributed to the field. There's also the idea of teaching the ideas of scholars from more diverse backgrounds. So as opposed to highlighting in your classrooms or in your work, um, you know, these uh, harmful figures, choosing to actually highlight uh, otherwise underrepresented groups um, of scientists. It's a good idea. Um, another one says being, um, saw it somewhere and then it moved to talking, essentially it was talking about not being a to uh, go on uh, talking about the, not afraid to go on, they called it a tangent, but essentially not afraid to go on with the discussion of who the individual was as, for fear of taking away from the class period when actually, um, as we talked about earlier, doing so actually adds um, to the, um, the academic um, value of the individual and of the class. I'll give you guys about two more, two more minutes to add anything that um, I have not read out loud yet or any other ideas.
So it seems like it um, has slowed down in terms of the responses. It seems the majority of the responses involve um, citing alternative individuals, um, being unafraid to, con to give space to discuss the history of the individual, contextualizing the individual. Um, anything I didn't mention, please feel free to put in the Q&A, um, but it seems those are the three kind of main um, ideas in the stickies. Um, and so I'm gonna stop the screen share. Uh, and so moving forward, uh, as I share another screen, uh, we are going to go back to the PowerPoint um, to just finish us off on thinking about what the takeaways were. Um, My apologies. Okay. Oops. And so we structured the key takeaways to model after the structure of the class in a way. So um, knowing your field. So some things that we hope for you to take with you today is that um, before discussing ideas or individuals in your field, as for the example of the harmful individuals we discussed in this workshop, um, you should be sure to know the history of the field. Is this the first individual to develop the idea? Are there new ideas since this have been since these have been developed? If you cite and acknowledge an individual or theory that might have harmful foundations, be sure to connect the history to current day issues that you are acknowledging how make sure that you're acknowledging how they may be harmful and incorporating it into your lessons or research by either offering time to discuss the ways in which the individual was harmful and the systemic isms that are alive in the field today and incorporating underrepresented individuals and in people you cite and other examples that were given in the stickies. Um, yeah, so that is, we wanted to give you all a tool to walk away from today, aside from the construction of a course. If Even if you're not able to structure a course for your department, there are things that we can do as individuals to combat um, the systemic oppression in each of our fields, as you guys um, showed very eloquently in the um, responses to the workshop. And Anita, if you wanted to add anything else before we close out. I just wanted to say thank you so much for leading us through that um, Jamboard session. Those were some really cool responses I saw, and it was exciting how um, many similarities there were across departments, despite there being lots of different figures from um, these different disciplines. One last comment I just want to make is that I'll put my email address in the chat. And if y'all are interested in talking more about what a class like this could look like in your department, um, definitely feel free to reach out. But besides that, I'm super grateful um, that we were able to give this session um, to people from departments across the graduate school, because this isn't just a biologist issue, um, as we really we really saw in these last 20 minutes. Melody, anything else to add? Okay. Yeah, yeah no, thanks. <laughs> Great, well then with that, thank you so much for coming to the session. And thank you to Anita, Melody, and Denai to, for leading today's session. My name is Melissa Bostrom, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Professional Development, part of the Race and Bias uh, Conversation Series planning team here in the Graduate School, and just trying to find my talking points, which keep disappearing behind other screens at the moment, um, <laughs> of course, right in the moment that I need them. Um, I also want to thank our panelists today, Annie, Ali, and I know there's one more, and Richard, who uh, were able to share their perspective on taking the class. Um, and what a wonderful opportunity to learn about developing an anti-racist graduate curriculum for scientists today. We hope that some of you who attended will be inspired by this model and see how these efforts could be uh, relevant to your own discipline. And we wanna thank you for being in the audience with us today and for your engagement 
with the conversation, with your questions and participation, uh, participation in the Jamboard activities. Before we let you go, we want to be sure that all of you know about the next event in the series, which is coming up on Friday, January 14th, 2022, uh, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., a workshop on becoming an upstander. So if you're interested in continuing to build your skills in anti-racism, this workshop can help you create a culture of respect and civility by stepping in when you see harmful or disrespectful behaviors. It'll be a highly interactive session that will feature RCR credit uh, for graduate students who participate. So we look forward to seeing many of you then. Until that time, good afternoon, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>